summary of Book 4. It proves sufficiently the lavish wealth of our own age in poetry that the pieces which, without conscious departure from the standard of excellence, render this book by far the longest, were, with very few exceptions, composed during the first thirty years of the nineteenth century. Exhaustive reasons can hardly be given for the strangely sudden appearance of individual genius, but none, in the editor's judgment, can be less adequate than that which assigns the splendid national achievements of our recent pro poetry to an impulse from the follies and wars that at the time disgraced our foreign neighbours. The first French Revolution was rather, in his opinion, one result, and in itself by no means the most important, of that far wider and greater spirit which, through inquiry and doubt, through pain and triumph, sweeps mankind round the circles of its gradual development, and it is to this that we must trace the literature of modern Europe. But without more detailed discussion on the motive causes of Scott, Wordsworth, Campbell, Keats, and Shelley, we may observe that these poets, with others, carry to further perfection the later tendencies of the century preceding, in simplicity of narrative, reverence for human passion and character in every sphere, and impassioned love of nature, that whilst maintaining on the whole the advances in art made since the Restoration, they renewed the half-forgotten melody and depth of tone which marked the best Elizabethan writers, that, lastly, to what was thus inherited they added a richness in language and a variety in metre, a force and fire in narrative, a tenderness and bloom in feeling, an insight into the finer passages of the soul and the inner meanings of the landscape, a larger and wiser humanity, hitherto hardly attained and perhaps unattainable even by predecessors of not inferior individual genius. In a word, the nation which, after the Greeks in their glory, has been the most gifted of all nations for poetry, expressed in these men the highest strength and prodig prodigality of its nature. They interpreted the age to itself, hence the many phases of thought and style they present, to sympathize with each, fervently and impartially, without fear and without fancifulness, is no doubt full step in the higher education of the soul. For, as with the affections and the conscience, purity and taste is absolutely proportionate to strength, and when once the mind has raised itself to grasp and to delight in excellence, those who love most will be found to love most wisely. Mm -hmm.